Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Principles and Performance Characteristics of Automated Platelet Counting Methods, presented by Donald Wright, Scientific Affairs Manager, U.S. Hematology, Abbott Diagnostics. I'm Alexis Krause of Labberts, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by Labberts and sponsored by Abbott Diagnostics. Now, let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the Answer a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credit. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credit. I'd like to now introduce our presenter, Donald Wright. Donald Wright is a Global Scientific Affairs Manager for Abbott Diagnostics Hematology. Donald has worked in clinical laboratory services and the commercial hematology industry for the entirety of his career. He has served in a variety of roles, including automated hematology supervisor, educational coordinator, scientific marketing, scientific liaison, flow cytometry, and cellular analysis specialist, and several managerial positions. His research and publications include applications of monoclonal antibodies with flow cytometry, char characterization of new hematology product performance, and development of novel hematology assays and markers. In his current role, Donald provides scientific support for healthcare professionals and serves as a scientific resource to various functions, including R&D, business development, global strategic operations, and other departments. Donald is a member of several organizations, including American Association of Clinical Chemists, International Society for Laboratory Hematologists, and the American Society of Clinical Pathologists. For a complete biography on Donald, please click on his photo in the top left corner of your screen. Welcome, Donald. You may now begin your presentation. Hello. Today we're going to start a presentation on principles and performance characteristics of automated plate accounting methods. This is a web series affiliated with LabRoot. Disclosure statement, the speaker program is sponsored by and on behalf of Abbott Diagnostics. The content of this presentation is consistent with all applicable FDA requirements. Today's hematology analyzer Analyzers utilize various methods for enumerating platelets, including electrical impedance, light scatter, fluorescence, and immunological recognition with monoclonal antibodies. While these approaches generally produce an accurate platelet count in the majority of samples, we all know circulating abnormalities have been shown to neg negatively affect the reliability of reported results. The impact on quality varies depending on the specific interference and technology used to determine the platelet count. So today in this webinar, different principles used for counting platelets and the effect of circulating interferences on the performance of each method will be reviewed. Max Schultz and Julius Mizazero have been recognized as the first two to describe platelets and their association with hemostasis. Schultz described the morphology of platelets and noted they were several times smaller than red cells. These are zero further observed platelets freely circulating in the blood. However, when subject to an influence that leads to thrombosis, they adhere to one another to form an accumulation and stick to each other. So platelets or thrombocytes are a nucleate discoid cell formed by the cytoplasmic fragmentation of bone marrow megakaryocytes. 
Pigacaryocytes are the end maturational stage of, se of the sequence which starts with a differentiation of a pluripotential stem cell. This process is mediated by stimulation principally by the glycoprotein hormone thrombopoietin or TTO. The pluripotential cells differentiate to become morphologically and immunologically distinct cells committed to a platelet lineage. These maturational changes include respectively the megakaryoblast, pro-megakaryocyte, and the megakaryocyte. You can see on the slide. Once the cells reach the megakaryoblast, it actually loses proliferative capacity and starts its maturation process. Megakaryopoiesis is this unique way of maturation that does not occur in any other cell lineage. The cell multiplies nuclear material within the same cell, which is called endomitosis, or in other words, nu nuclear division without cell division. Depending on the physiological need of new platelets, endomitosis stops and the formation of platelets begins. Through a process of cytoplasmic budding, each megakaryocyte is able to generate between 2,000 and 5,000 platelets which then circulate in the peripheral blood for about five to 10 days or become pooled in the spleen. Platelets themselves play a key role in primary hemostasis. The initial stage involves platelet adhesion. In this process, the platelets come into contact with the negatively charged surfaces of the exposed endothelial of the damaged tissue and adhere to them, as you can see in the diagram. This process is principally mediated through interaction between the platelet surface glycoproteins, particularly GP1B, von Willebrand's factor, and collagen fibers of the subendothelial. Once platelets have become stuck to the collagen, they undergo a series of morphological and biochemical changes, which constitute a secondary phase known as platelet activation. And mediated through cleavage of membrane phospholipids, biochemical signals begin a sequence of changes during which intracellular calcium levels rise, and the glycoprotein 2B3A complex is expressed in the surface of the platelet. And then these biochemical changes are associated with distinct morphological changes. Rather than remaining discoid, the activated platelets become more spherical with a distinct irregular pseudopod being projected from their surface. And once activated, the platelets begin to form a template in which the blood coagulation process is catalyzed. This pro process of platelet activation also initiates release of secretion of power, powerful secondary aggregating agents from the platelet granule. The release of platelet agonists like ADP and others causes propagation of the process which is platelet aggregation, as we can see on the bottom diagram. During activation, exposed glycoprotein 2B and the 3, 3A complex on the extended pseudopods cause platelets to bind together and basically to form the fibrin clot. The platelet count has become an accepted part of the automated blood count. The clinical value of platelet counting is a critical aspect of patient diagnosis and treatment monitoring and demonstrating of normal platelet counts in subjects tested part of a wellness check are valued and important as part of a pre-surgical screening process. Reported references, reference ranges for the platelet count of normal subjects typically fall in the 150 to 400,000 range. Uh, demonstration of thr thrombocytopenia or thrombocytosis are valuable if not specific, findings in the context of disease diagnosis. So when are platelet counts performed? As previously mentioned, screening CBC done routinely, and again, as a general wellness indicator, and also for preoperative screening. Disease monitoring to determine trend in patients with abnormal platelet counts that are secondary to, to a disease process. Therapeutic monitoring increases or decreases in platelet counts are important when monitoring patients, such on chemo, chemotherapy or other process monitoring. 
and of course platelet transfusion, ultimately assessing the severity of thrombocytopenia, res re the risk of severe bleeding, and or the need for platelet transfusion. Platelet disorders are most commonly uh, cause of bleeding and can be divided in essentially two categories related to the platelet number and or the platelet function. <clears throat> in this table below, you can see under platelet number, most often associated with thrombocytopenia, can be two types of issues, one congenital and one acquired. In the congenital categories, you see things such as nicocaryocytic hypoplasia, thrombocytopenia absent radii, and Wiscott Aldridge syndrome, which is a very rare uh, uh, congenital disease. Certainly, the acquired reasons include immunothrombocytopenia, thrombo thrombotic thrombocytopenia purpura, EIC, infections, splenomegaly, bone marrow suppression of infiltration, aplastic anemias. Platelet function, congenital, there's Glanzman's disease, Bernard Solier's, which is very rare, and storage granule defects. And of course, you can have always acquired platelet functions associated with medication, drugs, uremia, myeloproliferative disorders, which is really a thrombocyto, uh, thrombocytosis, and those associated with multiple myeloma. Platelet counting technologies and methods. Platelet technologies uh, and methods include the following. Manual phase microscopy and smear estimates are considered to be direct methods of, of uh, platelet counting. The impedance platelet count, which is routinely used in the laboratory, as well as optical platelet counting, which can include such things as dual optical angle uh, light scatter, fluorescence, and multi-angle light scatter. The reference method currently by the ICSH, which is the International Council for Standards in Hematology, utilizes the monoclonal approach using CD41 and CD61, testing for the GP3A and GP2B site located on the platelet. And of course, there are single platform approaches using just the immunoplatic of CD61. Phase contrast microscopy. Uh, this was the standard reference method by the ICSH for many years, and it involves using a Neubauer chamber, which you see on the screen, and is a graduated chamber that uh, will be filled with a sample solution. And when looking through the microscopic objective, you can see the, the grid lines uh, that is in the Neubauer. And you'll notice in the very center, there's five distinct regions that we count platelet. The red cells are lysed with the diluent, and then the chamber is charged. And the uh, microscopist then counts all five windows. And then using various calculations, we can determine the absolute platelet count. Another method is a qualitative platelet estimate. A qualitative platelet estimate is often used when an automated system flags the platelet count. There's been a discontinuation of about 10 years of the Unipet product, which was used to help uh, and assist us in making a quick dilution and performing the manual platelet count as we saw on the previous slide. In lieu of this discontinuation, a lot of platelets had to reassess how they do platelet estimates and now use this as their alternate technology for platelet confirmation uh, when the automated system fails to provide a count. However, at very low levels, the coefficient of variation in, is high and may result in increased discordance with the an analyzer result. Published by Nizanchuk back in 1978, one of the only studies that uh, is in publication indicates that the CVs can be as high as 50% when the level of platelet count is at 27,000, 
and 20 to 23 percent when it's between 65 and 100,000. Unfortunately, this is what a lot of laboratories have to resort to when there's no longer, uh, when there's a flagged automated count uh, presented to them. Next is the impedance plate account. Impedance plate accounting was first used as a semi-automated method and was subsequently used in automated cell counters pretty much from the middle of the 1970s forward. The principle of impedance counting is a passage of cells suspended in a known dilution through a small detection orifice called the aperture. Daylight used serves as an electrolyte solution through which a constant electrical current is maintained between the two electrodes. The cells flow through the orifice, they impede the electrical current, and resistance is detected. The detection of discrete resistance permits the counting of the event, the magnitude of that resistant pulse can be used to estimate the volume of that event. One of the known limitations of the impedance counting is the potential for a phenomenon called recirculation or eddy current effect, which can cause a false increase in the cell count. Uh, this phenomenon is shown in these diagrams. One on the left, you can see the cells passing through. The one on the right, what actually happens is when the cell is located to the edge of the orifice of the aperture, it can actually recirculate or based on its flow path, go back into the, the uh, detection zone and be counted again. This can falsely elevate the plate count, and uh, we have to be very aware of this. Various approaches to resolve this artifact have been applied. Some in instrument manufacturers use lateral flow of reagents to sweep already counted cells away from that detection zone around that orifice of the aperture. Uh, other manufacturers use a plate close to the orifice, which ensures that any cell recirculation that takes place will be removed from that detection zone. Uh, these devices are often called, after their inventor in this case, that's the Von Behrens plate. And another alternative that you see in the diagram below um, makes use of hydrodynamic focusing. And this technique employs a sheath of fast-moving fluid that guides and confines the cell suspension and targets it through the orifice of the aperture, ensuring that during analysis, the cells are continuously propelled forward, through, and beyond the orifice, and therefore away from the impedance detection zone. One further advantage of using hydrodynamic focusing is that it focuses the cells on the very center of that orifice. In this diagram, you can see the resulting impedance histogram. The image located on the far left is a typical image of a normal plate account. The one in the middle, you can see by the line on the right-hand side, which is considered the upper threshold of where platelets should end and RBC should begin, an overlap region, most likely in this case due to macrocytic thrombocyte. The one on the far right actually show, shows or indicates maybe a mixed population of some red cell uh, fragments or perhaps some large platelets. In any case, the two on the right indicate that we have a problem with the platelet count and most likely the result will be flagged and will have to be reconfirmed by alternate technology. The next method I'd like to discuss is the optical plate account. Optical methods work on the principle that a diluted sample suspension is passed through a flow cell, optically clear flow cell, and illuminated by a light source, in many cases a laser light source. Scatter from the laser, usually by measuring the two angles simultaneously, is then used to discriminate platelets from red cells and white blood cells. The advantage of the two-dimensional approach is that the resolution between the platelets and non-platelets is not based on size alone, and therefore considered to be more specific. 
on the right hand side you can see that there are two different scatter plots and different angles of, of observation are, are made in these two uh, different methods of optical platelet counting. This is another diagram of optical platelet counting. <clears throat> in general, the low angle scatter signal represents volume, whereas the higher angle scatter is derived from the cellular density. In this case, platelets, higher angle scatter mainly represents granulation. The diagram on the left again shows where the impedance count would indicate your platelet population, the threshold, generally around 33 ventilators, and then your non platelets that would be interfering with the count. On the scatter plot to the right, you'll see the optical platelet count is in the center, kind of in a gold population, and non platelets are indicated by the black population. The diagram to the right, you'll see the laser light hitting the platelet, and here we actually see the light scatter in really 360 degrees, but the forward light scatter and wide angle light scatter is where we're going to detect the difference between whether it's a platelet or on the right hand side whether it's a red cell. And again at the platelet side you can see a higher volume of light scattered and also some manufacturers use a dye that actually stains the platelets that can be detected at the side angle scatter area that you can see where it's either a red or perhaps a green dye. Next, next I'd like to speak about the reference method. And the reference method is the most reliable technology for measuring platelets and is based on the use of monoclonal antibodies to platelet specific surface antigens. The international reference method employs dual color immunofluorescence flow cytometry using a mixture of two different antibodies, CD41 and CD61. Platelets are identified by their reaction with these antibodies you can see from the center diagram. And the platelet erythrocyte ratio is determined by selective gating. Subsequently, erythrocytes are counted in a separate hematology analyzer which eventually allows calculation of the platelet concentration based on the scatters that we see on the right-hand side. This ICS, ICSH reference method is a two-platform technique, as I mentioned, which involves the use of a hematology analyzer and a flow cytometer. And this cannot be fully automated. This fact and the requirement for an experienced flow cytometrist kind of render it difficult to perform the reference method on a routine basis in the hematology laboratory. There's another single platform method available on the market for immunofluorescent platelet counting using the monoclonal antibody specifically for CD61. In this approach, the antibody is actually freeze dried into a small pellet and placed into a tube you can see in the diagram to the left. Packaged in a, in a uh, certain way, the tubes can be taken out and placed next to a EDTA tube and put into a sample rack and processed. Again, in about four and a half to five minutes, you will then have an immunoplatic count for CD61. Here's a clear example of the power of the immunofluorescent platelet count. In this particular single platform approach, you can see by this diagram, if you take a look at the lower right corner, where it says platelet O, meaning optical, platelet I, meaning impedance, and then CD61 under the impedance count. By looking at the platelet O and platelet I, you can see that there's interference. Looking at the histogram to the right, the impedance platelet count is clearly overlapping into the RBC sign. The optical count as well demonstrates that there's non platelet events located both above and below that uh, orange or gold population. If you take a look at the results, the optical was 43,000, but it has a star next to it, which usually means it's flagged and it has to be reviewed. 
In this case, this device also does an impedance plate account, and in this case, it's 94,000. The true plate account is actually under CD61, demonstrated by the two scatter plot, plots below, that has a value of 53,000. So in this case, the plate of the optical underestimated the count, the impedance overestimated the count. So you can see the value of the immuno plate account in this instance. So this to summarize, <clears throat> resolving platelet population. The one dimension approach, which is impedance, usually shows cells of only the same or similar size as the separating criteria. The overlap obviously can occur, just as we previously saw on the slide before. Two dimensional approach involves using two angle optical light scatter that we talked about. Again, you usually can see clear separation. However, there can be instances where, again, they could overlap. And again, the three-dimensional approach would be considered the multiple angle optical light scatter or fluorochrome tag monoclonal approach. In this case, even though there may be some interferences or similarities, it will ultimately be separated with the fluorochrome tag monoclonal antibody. Factors affecting plated count reliability. Quality of the plated count may be susceptible to plated count errors. There's two primary types of error, pre-analytical errors, which could be involved with sample collection and certainly can involve plated clumps, and also analytical errors, interferences that are found based on disease or other problems, such as microsites, schistocytes, or giant platelets. I've outlined in this table below interferences that impact plate account reliability. Falsely increasing your plate account can be a result of red cell fragmentation, extreme microcytic red cells, such as an iron deficiency, or thalassemia, microangiopathic hemolysis with schistocytes, or tooth burns with microspherocytes. WBC fragments can, can falsely increase the plate count because the fragments themselves are very difficult to distinguish from actual platelet, even when doing like an estimate. Microcytes, bacteria, malarial parasites, protein aggregates, immune complexes, and common microns can all contribute to falsely increased platelet counts. Decreases can be include platelet clumps such as EDTA-induced platelet aggregation, we call that platelet neutrophil stylitism, or poor sample quality due to clotting. Activated platelets due to degranulated platelets, and of course, abnormal platelet size, giant platelets such as in bernard Soye syndrome, may heglin anomaly, mild dysplastic syndromes, central thrombocytopenia, or microcytic platelets as in Liscott aldrich syndrome. RBCs, if small enough, can be classified as platelets. In this smear review, you can see on the right-hand side very small red cells. The right-hand right side, you can see red cell schistocytes. In both cases, this can impact the platelet count. Those can be generally counted as platelets by impedance systems and sometimes can even confuse the optical platelet count as well. Generally speaking, when MCVs are less than 60, the distribution will have some that are even much smaller than 60, and that's why they may be counted as large platelets. WBC fragments can be classified as platelets too. And if you take a look at the smear around the uh, white blood cells and where the arrows are pointing, you can see these small white blood cell fragments. And certainly any acute leukemia or high-grade lymphoma or malignancy treated with chemotherapy these can be a major contributor to false increase in platelet count. The far right-hand side, acute megaloblastic leukemia, one of the key reasons we see the WBC fragments. You should always be alert that overestimation should be suspected in all cases of malignancy where platelet count is higher than expected. 
Although rare, microorganisms may be responsible for unreliable platelet counts. In this smear, you can see intracellular platelets, or parasites rather. And in that case, uh, sometimes as the red cell were to hemolyze, they may become free and may falsely impact the platelet count by increasing it. Abnormal proteins may result in an increased count as well. Diseases or factors where abnormal plasma aggregates as affected the platelet count can impact many of the methods, especially the impedance platelet count. Conditions associated with paraproteins or cryoproteins and or mainly disorders of B cells and include lymphomas, the myelomas, and the macroglobulinemia. Platelet clumps and aggregates are common cause of falsely decreased platelet counts. We previously described in the smear review over on the right hand side, you can see platelet clumps clearly would decrease your platelet count. And platelet satellitosis on the right hand side would also be a candidate for decreasing your platelet count. Giant platelets may be misclassified as RBCs or excluded from the count entirely. They occur primarily in the myeloproliferative disorders such as the chronic myeloid leukemia and thrombocythemias and in rare hereditary disorders. Uh, it can also be acquired conditions such as the autoimmune idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, the microangiopathic hemolytic anemias. Platelets in these conditions are as large as or even larger than normal red cells. And again, in most systems, would overlap between the platelet population and the red cell population. Small platelets that may be excluded from the platelet count can occur as well, uh, such as Wiscott Aldrich syndrome. You can see how tiny these are generally platelets that fall uh, on the lower threshold of less than two to three centimeters and may be inadvertently excluded from the platelet count. So this can be a reason for, again, a lower count than expected. So what can be the clinical impact associated with errors in the platelet count? Most important is associated with the platelet count uh, is when the transfusion decision is to be determined whether to give platelets or not to give platelets. And one of the key provisions here is the platelet count transfusion trigger level. Generally, most laboratories and clinicians will look at a level of about 10,000. And that count becomes very important because obviously at the very, very low level that it is, the interferences that we previously saw can impact that value. So let's take it for example. If platelets counts were less than the 10,000, they would be needed with regards to platelet transfusion. As given, the limit risk of cerebral bleeding is, is taken care of. But if they're not given, certainly the increase in cerebral bleeding uh, can occur. Uh, if the platelet count transfusion trigger is not needed, may cause unwanted clinical effects such as a transfusion reaction if they're given, again, because of the erroneous platelet count being too low. And also, the expense and unnecessary waste of platelet product, because we know platelets are very expensive, and uh, from an inventory standpoint, also expensive to keep on hand. Obviously, if it's not needed, they have a good count, not given, there's no uh, no impact on the, on the patient care. So limitations of differential platelet counting methods associated with transfusion decisions. The far right hand side you can see I've labeled suitable for transfusion decision management and over on the left hand side the particular method. The manual platelet count, <clears throat> again because of its interferences based on plasma proteins, really do not impact it nor do interferences from microcytes or interferences with RBC or WBC fragments. Although sometimes the WBC fragments, even the new bar chamber, 
very hard to distinguish between platelets. But you can count giant platelets. You can see those clearly. But it does have a very low level of accuracy, as we previously described, and imprecise at less than 10,000. So when it comes to suitability or transfusion decision management, I would consider it highly unreliable. From the impedance plate account method, interferences can occur with plasma proteins, interferences from microcytes, uh, RBC, WBC fragmentation, and of course, the ability to count giant platelets. No, because if you recall, only looking at size, those would most likely fall into the red cell window. So it has a low level of accuracy, we would say below 20,000. It's somewhat reliable. But again, we'd recommend reviewing the smear before any plated transfusion would be administered. The optical plate account, again, uh, occasional interferences may be some from plasma proteins if, it, if it's aggressive, aggregates. Sometimes interferences from microcytes. And again, this can occur if the schistocyte or the microcyte is, is uh, abnormal in such a case that would emulate a platelet. Most likely this will not occur. This is kind of actually rare. Interferences from RBC, WBC fragments, again, occasionally. But again, distinguishing the platelets from the red cells, even if they were in fragmentation form, the platelet is usually considered denser due to the granulation and will separate from these. Ability to count giant platelets, again, could be variable. So from a low level of accuracy, it's limited to about 10,000 or that transfusion threshold that most, most laboratories would use. More reliable than impedance, but you still would need to review the smear. And of course, the immunoplatic count, as we reviewed, uh, there's virtually no interferences we've seen across most of the primary uh, uh, interfering substances. It's accurate, believe it or not, down to about 1,000, and certainly is the method of choice and is why the ICSH considers it the reference method. So let's summarize. Platelet counts are particularly important for clinical decisions on administering platelet products to patients with thrombocytopenia. Most methods for platelet counting are not very precise in the low range, and their accuracy can be compromised by the interferences we described. You know, analytical limitations of platelet counting may challenge the lower platelet transfusion threshold at 10,000. Again, that's where we have to then make a determination if there is access to the immunoplatelet count as that being the, the, uh, the approved or the best uh, way to make a decision for platelet uh, transfusions. And of course, the technological progress continues to bring improved platelet counting methods. So at this time, I'd like to ask if there are any questions and open up the lines. And I do appreciate your time. Thank you, Donald, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the answer question box located on the far left of your screen and we'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, if impotence method for platelets is so prone to problems, why are so many vendors still using this technology? Oh, thanks for that question. And uh, yes, impedance uh, technology is robust nowadays. I, I didn't mean to imply otherwise in a sense. But we must understand that with impedance technology, we do know what interferes with it. And actually, that's a positive because when we do see the interference, we know we need to obviously look at an alternate technology to validate that particular account. So it's a, it's a robust method. Um, uh, from an economic standpoint, I'm sure it's uh, well known uh, and easy to put into systems. And again, as I also described in the presentation, you know, a lot of the newer systems have resolved many of the types of error that occurred in the earlier systems with using impedance. And that, that's uh, such as uh, hydrodynamic focusing, um, again, uh, eliminating any kind of recirculation problem into the, the uh, detection zone. Uh, so I didn't mean to imply that it is a, uh, a bad method in any way whatsoever. It's actually 
like I say, quite robust. And, and if anything, uh, when you have an error, you will have an error, and you know that you have an interference that, that is present in that, that uh, particular sample and needs to be resolved. So uh, I hope that uh, helps to clarify that. Next question. Our next, yes, we have television in our lab. What do you think of the performance of the platelet count estimation versus other methods? Well, the television, and, and like I would probably uh, approach all uh, digital morphology type systems, is um, I think the key word in your question is plated estimation. Uh, as we know, these are not um, um, uh, devices that have been necessarily cleared. Some may have for that account, but it takes a great deal to uh, obviously come up with an algorithm that's extremely accurate as compared to doing an actual fixed um, dilution on a whole blood sample and then counting it in an event-by-event uh, clear distributional advantage uh, method that gives you an event per event based on the dilution ratio. So in that sense, you know, you're, you're, you're subject to in, in all of uh, digital morphology, the quality of the smear, and of course, if there's any issues with regards to making that smear, that can also uh, jeopardize or compromise your, your your estimate that you're getting. But again, it's an estimate. It's, it's based on pure statistics, the numbers of events that you can actually evaluate. Um, uh, I'm sure they do a great job and almost uh, give you a good estimate of what you're doing as good as you would be able to do, perhaps maybe better, uh, as an individual sitting down microscopically reviewing the field. But still just the same, it's not like actually getting an, a, a good number of, of a high number of events uh, when you have uh, uh, an automated uh, approach to it. So Donald, our next question is, on slide 19 where you mentioned that platelets and RBCs show unique signatures using multidimensional analysis, can you describe more about what you mean by the unique signatures? Uh, yes. <clears throat> Again, as we have evolved in counting uh, and evaluating platelets from automated methods, obviously, uh, as I did in the kind of dimensional overview of, of looking at just size, it's been a great uh, asset in, in counting accuracy and giving us the values that we can actually use from a clinical standpoint. Um, but when it comes to, again, interferences, this is the the prime objective of almost any um, areas in science playlist is to try to resolve as many of those interferences as we possibly can. So the evolution of optical playlist analysis did give us what we felt uh, another dimension to being able to resolve some of the uh, problems that occur, especially if you have uh, two events of the same size and impedance obviously takes, you know, a, a rather um, strong algorithm to try to decipher what that is and if it is truly an interference or just part of the platelet RBC populations. So the difference between platelets and RBCs, obviously, there are some physical characteristics that we can take advantage of when looking at them optically or, again, by other methods, that, as I suggested, with the immunoplatelet count. The primary is this, obviously, uh, platelets have granules, red cells generally don't, they shouldn't, and they have hemoglobin and platelets don't. So if we can take advantage of some of those intracellular characteristics, and perhaps we can get uh, another uh, dimension of of, um, of being able to define each one of those signals into two distinct events. So with that being said, when we get into more uh, additional uh, approaches, again, the definitive is using the monoclonal antibodies that are sensitive to the 2B and 3A sites of the glycoproteins and the platelets. That's the that's the ultimate. But again, as I mentioned, it's it's not practical to do one of those all the time. So we're, we need to look at a practical approach, you know, again, it's ever evolving, of using perhaps more angles of light scatter that could give us, uh, or different dyes that could give us more information, be more definitive in, in classifying the, the red stuff in the plate when we do have the interference, or in, more importantly, uh, those that may be of the same size. I have heard there is a new tube by Sarsted for pseudothrombocytopenia. Do you have any information on this tube, or what can it do for the lab? Um, yes, I mean, I've heard about it. I've not worked with it. So 
all I know is from this standpoint, um, we know that there is a, uh, a situation where EDTA sensitivity uh, from uh, individuals can cause platelet cell lytosis uh, around white cells, <clears throat> neutrophils in particular. And when we see that, obviously we know we have a decreased platelet count. So uh, again, I, I emphasize, you know, very important to make sense out of your results. Always cross check, look to see what there is. And obviously if there's a decreased platelet count, uh, you know, you would and should do a, a um, uh, scan or review of the smear. This particular tube, from what I understand, uh, obviously uses an alternate to uh, EDTA. So that would eliminate the sensitivity to that and uh, supposedly it would uh, um, cut down or eliminate supposedly the, the platelet uh, sensitive uh, EDTA satellitism. And that would be a good thing. Um, but again, you'd have to probably do a redraw in that case and then uh, perhaps then. Uh, rerun that sample. Is there any procedure to avoid platelet clumps for accurate platelet count? Just uh, as again mentioned in the presentation, uh, this is obviously a pre-analytical issue most of the time, and it does evolve uh, involve rather, you know, just taking your um, uh, precautions and following the appropriate technique for phlebotomy. Uh, when you're drawing any type of samples, as we know, um, you know sometimes when the sample's not mixed correctly upon uh, drawing and uh, other factors that can be involved with, with creating the, the uh, play the clot. Uh, but pretty much, I think if you follow the appropriate uh, techniques uh, in, in phlebotomy, we can avoid a lot of those mixing well after blood has been uh, drawn uh, and, and all the other you know, precautions that you should take. So other than that, I, I'm not a uh, advocate of, if there is a um, sample that's received in laboratory and you do see clots, uh, uh, I know some laboratories do try to remove those clots by agitation uh, or something uh, related to that, uh, vortexing, et cetera. Uh, I just think that the Create more problems than than you start out with, uh, aside from uh, perhaps requesting a new sample. I know that's more difficult for the patient, and sometimes the patient's an outpatient. It's, it's very hard to get that sample back in. But I think you know, again, most laboratories have a standard operating procedure set up to 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 manage that. So, Donald, our next question: How do you estimate platelets with a low hematocrit? Um, very difficult, <laughs> and more importantly, as you do have to consider, if you're doing a plated estimate, that you have your microscopic uh, factors adjusted appropriately for your samples that have anemia. And again, I think if you look at any of the uh, texts on how to conduct an appropriate, um, you know, plated estimate, uh, you know, it describes and it is painful, as a matter of fact. And if you have even two different uh, manufacturers of microscopes, each one of those should have different uh, factor involved when, it, when it's uh, regarding how many platelets per field you should uh, be spotting because obviously the objectives may be different. So it's just a matter of, of making sure that you've done enough of your um, pre-work to assure that your factors are good and robust enough and also you've done in your studies and have documentation for your factor analysis that you've done some with those that have uh, anemia and very low hematocrits. So it's just part of your setup for doing an accurate plated estimate. Now, what is the principle behind CD61 enabled to eliminate platelet clumps interference? Well, um, CD61 uh, process will not actually eliminate platelet clumps. If platelet clumps are found, you're going to actually probably, uh, in the one single platform I discussed, there'll be actually flags that come up and still indicate there's platelet clump. But what it can do is if, if there are schistocytes or other interferences that could resemble platelets or other types of interferences, maybe white blood cell fragmentation, uh, fragments, uh, those are very, very difficult to resolve. 
and certainly the uh, 61 and or 41 reference method uh, would be very specific. It is very specific for platelets and, and all of their interferences are eliminated. The one thing it would not eliminate if you had platelet clumps uh, it would attach to the clump and be very bright and would probably trigger, a, uh, would most likely trigger a flag that you have excess of uh, large platelets in it and you would still have to request a new sample. So Donald, you stated that immunoplatelet is unable to count giant platelet. Why? Um, what was that question? One more time, please. Of course. So uh, the question is, you stated that immunoplatelets is unable to count giant platelets. Why? That's not true. I don't think I said that. <laughs> immunoplatelet count can count giant platelets. The other methods on the market, which could be, again, some optical, again, the impedance, uh, those are the ones that are more difficult to count. Uh, those who will have some sort of a flag due to overlap. But if again, you know, any type of macrocytic thrombocytes present, you know, it will have the appropriate glycoprotein sites to adhere to CD61. So that, uh, if that was uh, understood in that manner, then I apologize and perhaps maybe uh, uh, just want to correct that. But uh, the immunoplatelet will count giant platelets effectively, more so than any other method on the market. Um, the other thing too. If you recall in that table, I also indicated that you know one, one of the interesting things, certainly your your estimate will help with giant platelets, as well as doing a manual count, which is very rarely done anymore. Uh, those giant platelets can be seen as well in those, uh, but the immunoplatelet can and, and will effectively count giant platelets. All right. So our next question it looks like. What methods exist for detecting immature platelets? I didn't touch on the immature platelets uh, so much, but the obviously the method, methods on the market today um, usually involve some sort of uh, nucleic acid dye, and the immature platelet is, obviously has residual RNA, and uh, with these particular uh, stains or dyes that are uh, intrinsic within the reagent systems, uh, do stain those and when you do a, a platelet count in this manner, you're looking for fluorescence. And the amount of fluorescence is directly proportional to the amount of RNA residual that's in that particular uh, platelet. And from that, we can actually uh, begin to reg or understand you know, the, the amount of immature platelet production that is present in that particular sample. Um, again, one of the problems with the immature reticulocyte, or I'm sorry, the immature platelet uh, uh, fraction is there are no standards yet in the industry. There's there's probably the controls aren't optimized at this point. There's not really a, an excellent analog that would cross all the technologies and methods that are out there uh, it, that exist. So you're, you're going to have to abide by the uh, manufacturer that you're using currently as your um, uh, source and reference range uh, uh, approach to how you establish that in your laboratory. Uh, there has been and there is, I believe, um, ongoing discussions in the ICSH International Council uh, for Standardization Hematology to obviously uh, find means and ways to find standards for such things as the uh, immature platelet fraction as well as even the immature red cell reticulocyte fraction. Uh, because those are still, again, more technology dependent. So uh, those are still challenges that have to be resolved in the future. Donald, in your opinion, what would be the next key breakthrough in automatic platelet counting technology to advance the field, other than more angles of light scatter? Well, um, I think there's one approach that obviously has proven itself to be the most robust, and that would be the immunoplatelet count. And um, two things of breakthrough would, would have to occur. I think there'd have to be a, uh, a reduction in cost of, of the monoclonal uh, itself to make it more practical to reflex whenever you had any type of flag associated with a platelet count on an automated system. Um, uh, it is a reference method. So in hematology, uh, we don't work in the same environment that chemistry does where you can go in and plot a standard 
and uh, calibrate a system to a reference standard, and we don't have that in hematology except for one, and that would be the immunoplatelet count. So if we could get the cost down and have that in a, um, a platform that could obviously deliver that in a completely automated fashion, uh, I think that would be one of the, the most exciting steps there is as far as accuracy goes, and it could certainly, uh, um, I think, help the clinician in many ways, knowing that their plate account, of course, they always believe everything's perfect from the laboratory. I cannot laugh at that, but uh, from a laboratory standpoint, we always know we'd have the absolute best plate account that we could, uh, we could uh, deliver to the clinician. With regard to platelet transfusions, is there any research underway that you know to, you know of to produce artificial platelets that could be used in a human transfusion? Um, what we've looked at, and I've worked with some companies, and um, there are the polymeric type of, of um, artificial platelet that's been worked on for probably, uh, I'd say, 10 plus years, just doesn't seem to have resolved uh, into a commercial product or evolved into a commercial product at this point. Uh, I'm aware of also the approach of taking platelets, human platelets, and, and biophilizing them and packing them so they have extended shelf life from a cost standpoint to be used in remote areas where it's hard to obviously um, uh, transport the product, the liquid product, uh, you know, to remote areas and a lyophilized product might be the next step in, in the evolution of uh, platelet transfusion. Um, again, one of these things, how far are we away from a synthetic product? It, it's very difficult to, you know, uh, many areas of medicine have, have, have been trying to use synthetic products, whether it be RBCs, whether it be um, any type of, of joint uh, replacements and things. Um, they definitely have their drawbacks, and some have not achieved any clinical success. So I think we're a little ways away yet, uh, but I do see some of these other products that come in are coming up in, in research that may be good alternatives. We've gotten so many good questions today, but it looks like we only have time for one more. Why are platelet levels so high in pediatric patients less than a year old? Well, that's an excellent question, and, and uh, there's several publications out there, and it's um, uh, pretty well known that the obviously the thrombopoietin is the primary regulator of megakaryal poiesis in, in, in the platelet production, and uh, it's pretty well established that TPO concentrations in uh, kind of a, a non-thrombocytopenic preterm and term infants is significantly higher than in healthy adults. So, with that being said, it's uh, it's uh, important that your reference ranges are set appropriately so clinicians don't overreact, or more importantly, they're not looking at adult ranges, uh, which could then uh, make them uh, have cause to obviously um, consider other types of, of, uh, of uh, diseases or, or again, continue to test for something that may not, in fact, be, not be there. So, um, with respect to that, I think it's important to again establish your neonate and uh, pediatric reference ranges to the manufacturer's uh, uh, system that you're working with and, and obviously have those posted uh, you know, in the laboratory and making sure that those are also in your, in your uh, results page whenever those are reported out. Thank you again, Donald. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Well, again, I appreciate you know, your attendance today. And certainly the topic of platelets will be with us for many years to come, and, and hopefully we can continue to improve on the accuracy of these uh, these reports and uh, the, the ability to count platelets in all diseases and, and eventually get to the point of eliminating interferences as being a problem with, with uh, counting. Um, you know, I, I have a lot of uh, uh, hope that we can get to that point. I think we have some methods out there that could uh, potentially get us there. And certainly, I think it's still a very important topic because obviously, uh, we have a, a variety of different systems out there. So most importantly is if you question something, always confirm it uh, with the uh, smear. I'm still a strong believer in human identification of uh, detection of disease.
So again, I thank you and I appreciate your time today. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions questions we did not have time for today or those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of the registration. We would like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor Abbott Diagnostics for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand through December of 2018. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye. And we're clear.